Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back to Jum'a Nights. We're back for season two. And like I said, we would be back with a bang. But unfortunately, we are meeting in circumstances that are tragic for all of the Muslims around the world when we see what is happening to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. So there is no better time than this time to discuss the reappearance of our awaited saviour, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hassan alayhi salatu wasalam. And that is what we will be doing in these next three episodes. So without further ado, let's begin by speaking about the scenarios of the reappearance. So we want to discuss this in the following points. Number one, what do I mean by there being multiple scenarios of the reappearance? Number two, what are the three scenarios that are possible with regards to the reappearance. Number three, what does the second scenario entail? And number four, how can we ensure that we remain on the second scenario coming up to the reappearance? So when we're talking about scenarios, we're talking about multiple paths that Allah has designated for the humans to go through, right? As we've mentioned in previous episodes of Jum'ah Nights in season one, Allah wants the human to reach its highest potential and for, by some extent we see that happen at the time of the Dhuhr and even more so at the time of the Raj'ah of the Imams. So all of the stuff that has happened in history has been leading up to the humans being able to reach their highest potential and that's why everything has been taught to us step by step. We had the prophets and they came to set the foundation for what is to come after with Rasulullah wasallam. Then we had Rasulullah who set the foundation for the Ahlul Bayt wasallam, And we have the Ahlul Bayt who set the foundation for the Qa'im from Al Muhammad wasallam. So that's why we've had teachings from the prophets, from the imams of Ahlul Bayt wasallam, and they've come step by step. They've come in a way that allows us to reach our highest potential through a journey, right? So that's why we see here that Rasulullah uh, set the foundation for the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt before Al Qa'im bin Al Muhammad salam, set the foundation for him and for his Dhuhr. Now, what's interesting here is that these paths or this journey can actually change based on our actions as the Ummah. And Allah changes the outcome or the scenario that we are in based on the actions of the Ummah. Right? And that might sound a little bit strange. Of course, we all believe as Shia that Allah is knowing of all the possibilities and all of the outcomes and he knows what is going to happen. However, there is a certain level of responsibility that Allah puts on the believers in terms of what is to be what is to come and what is to be like destined, right? So our actions actually can affect the outcome, right? And this is uh, covered by the concept in theology known as Bada. And I just want to give a small introduction to this concept from the Quran so that we can understand basically where we're going with this discussion. If we go to Surah Al Rad, the ayah number 39 after the Basmala, Allah says, Bismillah rahman rahim Yamhullahu ma yasha'u wa yuthbit wa indahu umul kitab. Allah says that Allah erases that which He wishes and He affirms that which He wishes. And it is with him that he has the foundation of the book, the mother of the book, right? So Allah here is saying in this verse that Allah erases that which he wants and he confirms and affirms that which he wants, right? And this is something that we find in the ahadith where the imams explain that this is a example of bada in the Quran, explaining the concept of bada. The idea that Allah can actually take someone's destiny or take... Uh, the events that are to happen in the future and erase and confirm that which he would like, right? So Allah is confirming that in the Quran. This is the concept of Bada. And we actually see this in some of the stories of the prophets. If we take uh, the, an example, and this is the example that is used the most, one of the easiest examples to remember also. We see in ayah number 142 of Surah Al-A'raf, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa wa'adna Musa thalathina laylatan wa atmamnaha bi'ashrin fatamma miqatu rabbih. Allah says that he had promised or he had asked Musa for 30 nights originally. This was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he completed it with another 10 nights. He changed it in other words. He did that because of the actions of the Ummah of Musa at the time. Yeah. So it says here that Allah completed it 
with 10 more nights. Allah changed that. This was bada occurring because of the people of the time straying from Allah's mission and Allah's orders and worshipping the calf. Allah increased the nights with Musa and he made them 40 nights. So this is an example of bada in the Quran. Allah originally wrote for there to be 30 nights and then he changed it to be 40 nights based on the actions of the ummah. So you might be thinking, why are we speaking about this? The reason why I want to bring this concept into this discussion is because this is a concept, a theological concept that affects Islamic history to a very great extent. This is a huge concept in our theological understanding of Islamic history and that which is to come. If we take a look at at the time of Rasulullah wasallam, what was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Rasulullah went to Ghadir Khum and he mentioned that Amir al-Mu'mineen is the successor after him, he is the wasi of Rasulullah, he is the first Imam, he is the one that the Quran needs to be taken from. That was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was what was supposed to happen. Yeah, Amir al-Mu'mineen was supposed to become the, the successor of Rasulullah on the ground. We were supposed to see his Khilafah. We were supposed to see the great ulum of Al-Muhammad to the greatest extent. We would have reached unthinkable heights by now if that had actually occurred. But what happened? The Ummah betrayed him. The Ummah betrayed Amir al-Mu'mineen. They betrayed Rasulullah. And for that reason, Allah set, them, set us on a path that is completely different. The first scenario, therefore, is what is the scenario of, of Ghadir. That is the scenario where what Rasulullah said actually came to actualize in that Amir al-Mu'mineen would be accepted by the Muslims as his successor, as the Imam, as the first Imam, as the one who we take our religion from. But that did not happen. So Allah set us on the second path, which was the path of Qurban, right? And you might think, where do I get this name from? The path of Qurban, the path of sacrifice. We see this in the words of Sayyida Zainab when she says, as she carries the pieces of the bodies of Imam Hussein, she says, Oh Allah, accept from us this sacrifice. Sayyida Zainab speaks on behalf of the Ahlul Bayt when she says, Accept from us this Qurban, this sacrifice. Right? And this is the path that the Ahlul Bayt had to take in order to expose their enemies and it began with Sayyidah Fatima and we saw this in the hadith in, in, in Al-Kafi we've mentioned it previously in, in previous episodes but I just want to come back to it really quickly it's that idea of the ayah in the Quran where it was revealed uh, for some people who were plotting against Ahlul Bayt and against Rasulullah and then the Imam says that when that plotting occurred when they wrote that book al-kitab. once that book was written i.e before that book was written Imam al-Hussein did not have to be martyred he did not have to be sacrificed yeah we had the scenario of Ghadir everything was going to happen as Rasulullah had said Imam, Imam Ali was going to be the Imam the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt would be Khulafa one after the other and this would not have to occur. But once that book was written, إِذَا كُتِبَ الْكِتَابِ قُتِلَ الْحُسَيْنِ Once that book was written, Imam al Hussein had to be martyred. He had to be sacrificed in order to further the mission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that journey of helping the human to reach their highest potential. And this was necessary in that greater mission. So these are things that we need to actually take lessons from. If the Ummah at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had betrayed him and for that reason we've gone on a completely different path that is a also a possibility at our time we have to be able to take lessons from these narrations and the context that we learn from in islamic history so in our context how can we or how do our actions affect the outcome of the reappearance we see that in the narrations that the shia at the time of the Ghaybat al-Kubra or the second Ghaybah, which is what we are living in, have the potential to either bring the uh, Dhuhr closer or to push it back further based on our actions. So with their actions, they have the potential to affect what happens in the Dhuhr, right? So we have three scenarios here. We have the first scenario, the scenario of Ghadir, the scenario where everything goes well. And then we have the second scenario, 
which is the scenario of Qurban, the path of sacrifice, which is what we are currently on today. And we have the third scenario, which is the scenario of the last day. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later, where we're going to discuss a little bit further what that means. What is the third scenario and how can we avoid getting to it? So as we've understood, the second scenario is the path of sacrifice, the path of Qurban. So this is the understanding that we are on the second scenario. We are on the second path as of now. And depending on our actions, we could be moving out of this scenario. So let's discuss what does the second scenario actually entail? We have in Kitab al Ghaybah by Sheikh al Nu'mani, and this is a book that I always, always, always recommend to everybody to read, to understand. It has a lot of narrations with regards to the uh, understanding of the uh, alamat, the signs that come before the Dhuhr, and a lot of explanation with regards to the Ghaybah and all of those things with regards to the, the Imam of our time, Sahib al Am. So we have a hadith on page 184 of Kitab al ghaybah by Shaykh al-Nu'mani. He narrates a hadith from Umar ibn Handala from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Where Imam al-Sadiq says that lil qa'im khams alamat. That for the qa'im of al-Muhammad there's five signs. Okay. We know that there's actually more signs than this. But I'm going to explain what these five signs are and why they're important. He says Duhur al-Sufyani. The rising of as sufyani Wal Yamani and the Yamani was Sama and a calling from the sky Wakatlu Nafsu Zakiya and the killing of a pure soul Nafsu Zakiya Wal Khaswu Bil Baida and the sinking of a uh, of a desert. Right? That's what some of these uh, narrations explain. There's a lot of explanation about what Al Khaswu Bil Baida is. But yeah, so these are the five signs that the Imam mentions here. What we see here is that these are described as the alamat al hatmiya right? So we have the alamat al hatmiya which are necessary signs prior to the reappearance of the Imam. And we have the alamat ghayr al hatmiya which are the signs that are not necessary. So you might hear a lot of different signs of the reappearance of the Imam. Some are actually necessary and some are not necessary, unnecessary. But... All of these signs are actually subject to bada, that theological concept that we discussed in the beginning. What does that mean? So if we were to have alamat al hasmiya we have here that prior to the imam's reappearance, these are the necessary signs. We have the idea that Sufyani has to come, Yamani has to come, there has to be a calling from the sky and so on, right? So we know that these are the signs that are necessary and these are basically generous signs for us to be able to know the timelines. The people of cognizance, the people that understand the narrations will be able to use these and to judge basically the events when they see them uh, basically in, unfolding in front of them, they'll be able to know. So we have this sign, this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. So now we can prepare for the reappearance of the Imam. But what is interesting is that these signs are subject to Bada. Some of the scholars have said that the Bada that happens in these signs are with regards to the details of what happened. So in some of the narrations, you might have a description of Sufyani. The, I, the idea that, for example, he is he has this description, he looks like this, or he comes from here. And the ulama say that it's possible that these things can change. So in terms of his description, maybe he might look a little bit different. Maybe he might come from another place. But the sign has to occur. That's what some ulama say. But we can see in some of the narrations that it seems that some of these signs don't need to occur at all. We have in this narration also in Kitab al by Sheikh al-Nu'mani on page 222 and 223, we have a narration from Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. It mentions that the uh, the companion says that we were with Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam and someone mentioned the Sufyani and the idea that he is from the Hatmi signs, from the Min al-Mahtum, the idea that he is from the signs that have to occur. So he asks the Imam, he says, Hal Yabdullah fil Mahtum? He says, Can Bada occur in the Hatmi signs that we have for the Imam of our time? The Imam says, Qala Naam. He said, Yes, Bada can occur. So the companions become a bit frightened. They're like, Okay, Qulna lahu, Fanakhafu an Yabdullah fil Qa'im. So we're scared now that maybe Allah will cause Bada to occur in the coming of the Imam of our time. What if Allah decides that the Imam doesn't won't come then due to Bada? 
The Imam says, إن القائم من المئات والله لا يخلف المئات. He says that Imam Al-Qa'im, the Imam of our time, is from the promises of Allah. And Allah does not turn back on a promise. So the Qa'im, the Imam of our time coming in itself, is something that has to happen. That's something that will not change. But with regards to all the signs that we spoke about, the Hatsmi signs and the non-Hatsmi signs, they're things that may not happen, right? There might actually be a bada occurring in that, in that sign, and those signs may not actually actualize. And if we take a think about that, why would those things not actualize? If we, if we look at the purpose of these signs, what is the purpose of the Alamat al hatmiyah It's the idea that this is a generous kind of, you know, signs for us to be aware. So we can be like, you know, now I can prepare. Now I know this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. So it's a level of lutf. It's a level of kindness towards us so that we can follow the events as they're happening and we can have an idea of what we're going to do next. Why would Allah take that away from us? Why would there be bada in these signs? They can, it can only be taken away as a result of a lack of strategy, a lack of preparation. A situation in which the Shia have not prepared for the Imam. They have not prepared the foundations that the Imams planned for us to prepare. We had this whole Ghaybat al-Kubra in order to prepare for the Imam of our time. We've been given all the tools, we've been given all the books, we've been given all the knowledge, we've been given the, all the time to prepare strategically, militarily, aqaidi uh, wise in terms of all of our understandings, right? In terms of how we are as communities, we've been given all that time, but we don't do that. We don't strategize, then Allah can take all of those generous things away from us, those signs that are supposed to prepare us, and He can take them away through bada. And the Imam will still reappear because he is from the promise of Allah. So what is that scenario where we don't have any of the signs and the Imam returns? This is the third scenario that we are speaking about. The idea of the scenario of the last day. And the last day narration is one that's actually quite famous. You might hear it quite a bit. Where we have this narration here from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm reading from Bihar al-Anwar volume 51. We have this narration where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says لَوْ لَمْ يَبْقَى مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا يَوْمٌ وَاحِدٌ لَطَوَّلُ اللَّهَ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ حَتَّى يَبْعَثُ اللَّهَ رَجُلًا مِنِّي أَوْ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِي He says that even if there was only one day remaining from the life of this world So what Rasulullah is saying that if there was only one day left for the earth to remain habitable then Allah would still send the Qa'im. He would still send Imam al-Mahdi and he would lengthen that day as long as possible in order for the Imam to return. So here what we see is that in that situation, there's only one day left of the earth being habitable and the Shia have still not come with strategy. They have still not prepared the ground for the Imam of the time to return. Then the Imam has to return regardless. So the, Allah will lengthen that day and the Imam will return. But what is the scenario? This is the third scenario. This is the scenario where there are no signs prior, right? This is the worst case scenario. This is where the Shia have literally failed in their mission. We have not prepared. We have not strategized. We haven't prepared the ground for him whatsoever. And the Imam has had for that day lengthened for him to return into it. And if this was to occur, well, ayadu billah, this would be the biggest failure for the Shia. This would be one of the most sad things that could happen for the Shia. For them to have all of that time in Ghaybat al-Kubra to actually prepare themselves, to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Imam of our time. And if we are not able to do that, and this is the situation that we get to, that there's only one day left and Allah has to just force the reappearance and for the Imam to return, without those signs, then we are a finished nation. We are a completely destroyed and useless nation. We have, there's no use for us for the Imam of our time, if that was to occur. And that is the scenario that we're completely trying to avoid. We need to strategize. We need to have groundwork prepared for the Imam of our time, if we are to call ourselves his Shia. If we take an example of this that has happened actually in the past, yeah, if we take a narration from Tuhaf, so we have a narration with regards to this very matter happening in history. The Shia being poor in their strategy, being poor in their planning. 
And for that reason, things got delayed. We have this narration of the will of Imam Sadiq. What does he mention? He mentions, For Wallahi laqad qaruba hadha al amr thalafa marat. Fa that to moor. For Akharahu lah. Wallahi ma lakum sirrun illa wa aduukum a'lamu bihi minkum. Look at the, the situation that the Shia reached at the time of Imam Sadiq. Imam Sadiq is speaking about his own time. He says, I swear by Allah, the Amr, this matter had become so close. And you guys, you ruined it. Father Tumu, you lost that chance. Why? Allah delayed that now. He's delayed the Amr. He's delayed the affair of the Shia coming back to power. This is talking about the Imam uh, the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, where there were three times where the Shia were actually in a position where they could have had a revolution. You know that that period of time was quite a sensitive time. You had the, the uh, fighting between Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas. That was a very vulnerable time. So the Shia actually had an opportunity at that time to revolutionize and to have a small faraj, a small relief where the Imam would have been the head of the state, maybe for a short period of time. But the Shia were not able to actually actualize this because of their poor planning. Look what the Imam says. He says, Wallahi ma lakum sirrun illa wa aduakum a'lama bihi minkum. That you guys don't even have a secret except that your enemies know more about your secret than you do. This is how bad you are at strategizing and planning. And for that reason, there's no forage for you until the Imam, Imam al-Qa'im comes. This is sad. This was at the time of Imam Sadiq. There was still time, you know. You still have the 12th Imam to get to. But this is our last opportunity. The Shia of that time were not able to keep a secret, right? You, they, they have a little plan and then, you know, someone blabs it to someone else and then it gets to Banu Abbas and then the enemies know what's going on. So we're not able to revolutionize in the way that we needed to. This is a sorry state of affairs if the Shia are not able to strategize and plan without our enemies knowing what our plans are. That's what the Imams want from us. They want strategy. They want smart Shia. And we've spoken about this so many times in our previous episodes. And it's so important to know that this is not a deen of vibes and a deen of passion and just, you know, just emotional energy and adrenaline. Just, ah, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to fight and I'm going to do this and that. It's not like that. You have to have strategy. The Imams expect that from us. They want aqul. They want, uh, they want ma'rifah from us. They want understanding and the plan and all of those things in order for us to prepare for the reappearance of, our, of, of the Imam of our time. If we were to fail and we were not to have strategy and we were to fail in the planning for the groundwork of the Imam, we would be going into the third scenario which is the last day, the idea that there's only one day left, no signs, and the Shia have failed their mission. That is the saddest, saddest scenario that we would be, be in. So what's important here is to, to realize that the Imams don't want us to sit around. The Imams don't want us to go to the Masajid, go to the Husayniyat, have our uh, Majalis, have a bit of Latam and go home and forget about what's happened. That's not what the Imams expect us to do. And unfortunately, that's the situation that we are in very much so right now. The Imams expect us to strategize. Imagine if the Imam has to come in that third scenario, in the last day scenario. Imagine how that scenario is going to be. If you look at this scenario, the, the, the Imams don't even like speaking about it. The Imams don't even want to speak about a situation in which the Shia have failed. There's very few narrations about the third scenario. It's sad, the Imams don't want that to happen. But we have to actually make sure that we are the people that are driving force to keep us on the scenario that we are on, the second scenario, inshallah. And this is where we have to understand the importance of active intidhar. The idea that we have to be on it. Yeah, Everything that we do, everything that we do on a daily basis, our jobs, our career, what we're doing with our families, what we're doing on social media, everything that we do in our day has to be towards that direction, towards the imam of our time. We've mentioned this narration before, I'm going to mention it again. We have in Kamaluddin, what's Imam al-Ni'mah, speaking about the people at the end of times being the greatest people of all time. 
the Imam says, Ya Aba Khalid, in Ahl Zaman Ghaybati, he al Khailina bi Imamate, wal Muntadarina li Dhuhuri Afdala min Ahl Kuli Zaman. He says, Oh Abu Khalid, the people of his Ghayba, the ones that believe in his Imama, and those who await his Dhuhur, they are the best of people of all time. Li Anna Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala Atahum min al Ukhuli, wal Afhami, wal Ma'rifati, ma Sarat bi Hil Ghaybat u Indahum bi Manzirat al Mushahada. He says that because Allah gave them from Ukhul, from intellect, from afham, from understanding, from ma'rifah, such that the ghayba for them became mushahada, I, as if the imam is with them. This is what we need, we need to be aiming for, right? We need to be aiming for ma'rifah, for aql, for strategy. This is what the imam wants from us. This is what was expected from us. If we had done everything that we were supposed to do in the ghayba al-kubra, then we would have been in this situation, but we're not. So you need to think about what has gone wrong. We need to think about it all. We need to see in our history, where did we go wrong? What did we do wrong such that we're not in this situation right now? And this is why the imam here, he ends the narration by saying, haqqa He says that these are the actual people that are sincere and our true Shia. The ones that are able to prepare, the ones that are able to strategize. These are our Shia. The imam is proud of them because this is the path that he set out for them. This is what you were supposed to become. This is what we were supposed to become. This is what we should be looking at and crying because we're not this yet. We are... Unfortunately, if we remain on the path that we are and we are not able to strategize for the Imam of our time, then we are a very so we're in a very sorry state of affairs. We should be crying that we have not reached this. And he says, What do us illadinillahi azza wa jalla sirran wa jahra? And they are the ones who call to the religion in secret and in open. Waqala Ali ibn al Hussein in Tidarul Faraj min Adam al Faraj. Waiting for the Faraj, waiting for the relief, active in Tidar is actually the greatest of the Faraj. The best of actions that you can do after Ma'rifah is waiting for the Faraj. Active in Tadar. This is what the Imams expect from us, being active in this matter. So it's concepts like these that show us that we need to have a proactive stance on what is happening around the world in terms of oppression to our brothers and sisters in places like Palestine and other places around the world. This is a situation in which the Shia cannot be the ones to say, what do we have to do with it? What has Palestine got to do with us? What has this country got to do with us? We're, they're not Shia, we're this, we're that. That is the complete opposite of what we should be doing. If that is the situation that we are in, then that is what will push the third scenario. If we are able to be that apathetic, that careless, that confused, that we think that this has nothing to do with us, we don't have to uh, support the Palestinians, we don't have to do anything because they're not Shia, then you are in a very, very, very bad position. And it's really sad that there's people that claim to be people of Hadith, people that have studied the Hadith, and they're not able to understand that Bayt al-Maqdis is a significant piece of land. They're not able to understand that Ahl al-Bayt taught us to stand with the oppressed. They don't know the last words of Amir Mu'mineen to his sons, Imam al-Hassim, Imam al-Hussein, that we need to be a helper to the oppressed and an enemy to the oppressor. These were the, 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 this is the will of Amir Mu'mineen. This is the, why we call ourselves Shia. This is the Husseini identity that we have to stand up in the face of oppression. If we're not able to do that, then what's the point in calling ourselves Shia of the Imam of our time? And it's this very neutral, on the fence mindset that will take people away from the Imam of our time when he comes. When the Imam of our time returns, would, how do you imagine it? Do you imagine a garden of flowers and everybody happy and holding hands and dancing? That's not what's going to happen. There's going to be a very polarizing time. It's going to be a time where we have to stand for the truth. The Shia have to be prepared to stand for the truth in the face of adversity, in the face of all of the whole, the enemies all around the world, all looking towards us. That is a time where we need to stand for the truth. If we can't stand for the truth now, what do you expect at that time where it will be a time of great fitna, a time of great confusion? There'll be people saying this isn't the Imam. There'll be people saying, you know, how can the Imam do this? How can this happen? How can that happen? And they'll confuse you and you'll be on the fence. You'll be like, oh, I don't know, to be honest, that scholar said that that's not the Imam. Or uh, my friend said this, or I don't know, uh, maybe, you know, I'll wait a bit and I'll see what happens. And maybe, you know, it's nothing to do with me right now. It, all of these things are, are going to take you away from the mission of the Imam. This is a time for us to be able to recognize the truth from the falsehood. 
This is a time for us to become acquainted with the Quran, with the Hadith, with the theology, with the mission of our Imam and have active intibar. This is a moment where this is a turning point. If at this stage in time, despite what is happening in terms of oppression, in terms of the children of Palestine being killed, in terms of women and children being forced out of their houses, in terms of men being killed every single day, we've come up to uh, a death toll of 15,000 on the day that I speak. 15,000 and you still think this has nothing to do with you, the Shia don't have to care about this. This is where you know, this is where there's a turning point. If you are not able to understand at this point, then, you know, maybe you need to really rethink your understanding of the religion and of Tashayu towards the Imam of our time. And that's why at the After Maghrib team, we've been working to start a campaign for Gaza, which you'll be seeing in the coming weeks, inshallah. And there will be an account that you can follow and you can find in our bio at the very least the least that we can do is we can donate money towards the people of Gaza and we can help them through their plight and make sure that we are keeping them in our prayers every single day in every salah that we recite in every dua that we make we need to include them in our prayers so if there's one thing that we can do for them is to donate to this noble cause and inshallah all of the information will be available for you very soon I hope that's being an informative episode and that we have learned some stuff along the way. I'll see you again next week, inshallah, where we'll be continuing this topic. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.